Hello, good morning and welcome back to the Watching Brief for the month of March 2020. I am joined as ever by the so far perfectly healthy Andy Brockman. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, Mark. Thank you. I, was, I can see you're doing your bit for the health of the Northeast. Oh, I am. Yeah, it's the PPE, personal protective equipment. You know, it, it, a little bit of rose scented petals in the nose here. And, and I'm good. Have you got your pomander? You have your pomander? I do. I do. And I, I'm pro protected from the miasma. Uh, I think that this household will be will be fine. <laughs> I hope so. And, and, and actually, in all seriousness, before we start, I hope yeah. uh, our, our, our viewer and uh, anyone who knows our viewer will be remain healthy as well in this uh, these remarkable times. Well, yes, these these very strange times. Now, you see, now it comes the, the hazard of taking this mask off without bashing the microphone and wrecking everything. Actually, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to mute the mic for the sake of our viewer. Just a second. I'm just going to sit here and watch and enjoy Yay! Aha! There we go. I think I think that worked. I think... <laughs> Was that really worth it? Was that really... <laughs> answers below the line? <laughs> Nonetheless, um, yes. This is uh, we we've started with some levity uh, because this month's ongoing watching brief, uh, our ongoing mission to quantify and discuss the news, archaeological news of the month, uh, for you guys to expand on and comment below. Uh, is dominated certainly at the beginning of, of this month's watching brief by by one thing that's really overshadowed the the month uh, and that is of course um the coronavirus the novel uh, strain covid19 just just briefly I just 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 to just to just to, come, just to check in it, how how are things with you yours and your locality in terms of uh, uh this this uh, this pandemic well thank well, thank thankfully, uh, in terms of um, my uh, immediate family, so far we're all healthy, um, and um, obviously we're, as is everybody else in the in the UK, apart from key workers, um, we're in lockdown, so we don't leave home except to shop, to take exercise, mm -hmm. uh, attend to any medical needs, visit the pharmacy or whatever if we need to. Um, it's a very strange time. Mm. Um, that said, in my extended group of friends and colleagues and other archaeologists, um, at least one person has uh, come through, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, the COVID-19, uh, COVID um, actually having a, she, uh, having, she, she thinks, um, picked it up in um, a, uh, a visit to Italy. Right, I see, yeah. So, mm. okay. um, it, which I think, you know, if that, it, it, it just shows how this has come about and come about really quickly and how everybody's learning as they go along i mean other other, other issues obviously we'll pull out um, mm. as we as we talk but mm. um it is it, it's almost like doing um london's done an emergency stop if you equate yeah. it to driving a car mm -hmm. and um at the moment we're sat in the middle of the road wondering what's next and whether we're going to be able to drive on and how yeah yeah, no, and, uh, uh, and in that sense, I suppose, uh, again, before we dive into the news stories, um, I suppose this has really highlighted the the shared uh, footing that we have as humanity on this planet. Spaceship Earth is a biome, and in this instance, the biome is, is absolutely being shown to be interconnected and complex. And, uh, and I... I, I <sighs> You know, I mean, again, uh, touch wood and all that. I, hopefully, we'll be okay. Mrs. Soup, for example, is working from home at the moment, although she works with with very um, vulnerable people in a local hospital. So, so she's sort of orchestrating things from a distance. Um, and I'm I'm hoping I'll be okay. I do have some complicating factors in my in my medical history, but I'm sure I'll. I I think I'll be okay. I hope I will. Uh, but I I hope that that out of this will come will come some positives. I mean, for example, reassessments of, of the need for long distance travel for, for a face to face meeting when, when technology does that job or can do that job or for th things linked with pollution uh, and another aspect of that. I think, well, and also as well, this this sense of, of the interconnectedness of, of humanity, uh, you know, you can't, you can't have a protectionist policy against 
against the virus. It doesn't care what country you're from. <laughs> you, you know, you can't um, build a wall. No, exactly. You can't. You can't build a wall. You can't. You can't shut off a uh, shut off an island. You know, it's um, it's yeah. I think uh, the, the interesting and strange times. And and I guess we'll yeah we'll we'll. we'll we're yet to see what the ramifications of those will be in terms of the history books, I suppose. Um, and, and that actually, as we were saying just off camera, as Andy was saying, sorry, uh, we, we are seeing history again being written. We've seen it arguably in this country over the past three years with uh, with the B word. Um, <laughs> obviously, the swear jar is but, still but, in effect. What, what, what was that? It was something we used to discuss quite a lot, isn't it? It's completely different. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the agenda exactly uh, it'll yeah. be back don't worry it will be back um, that's, one, that's one thing i'm happy to predict <laughs> indeed like a bad penny so yeah. uh we can't put it off for any longer let's dive in uh, first of all then uh to the the unavoidable uh, archaeological um, uh, story that is the impact of covid19 on the sector um now we're leading this segment in terms of links associated links with um a uh, uh, the the government advice here in the UK, the gov dot uh, gov UK website. Obviously, each each nation, each country has its own specific advice, but it's all very similar in terms of uh, social distance, distancing, etc. Um, but in particular, it's it looks as though, uh, for example, Historic England has uh, put together um, a statement on the impact of coronavirus. Um, sh shall we start there and then sort of branch out into other impacts? Yeah. So Historic England have put out their own advice uh, to archaeologists about working safely in the field. Other uh, organisations have done similarly. Uh, representative bodies have done the same thing. Um, if anybody is out there and still working in the field, do look at that advice, follow it. And if you are uncomfortable with it, uh, then question your, your bosses, question your the person that's employing you. And if necessary, and if you don't feel safe, withdraw because you are perfectly entitled to do that. Well, in that sense, um, what 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 are the primary concerns identified then in in terms of uh, the risks to archaeologists and people working in the heritage sector? It's to do primarily with an inability to follow the government's uh, advice, which is now law actually, mm -hmm. on social distancing. Yeah. Um, the government is saying that it wants people to remain at least two meters apart mm -hmm. when they're out in the open unless uh, it's a member of your immediate household. Now, obviously, on an archaeological site, that can be very, very difficult to achieve um, because often people are working in confined spaces, often people are sharing um, equipment to under un undertake processes like mm -hmm. recording, like lifting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then not to mention um, sh get getting to and from work. The issue, one of the issues in London have been, has been people crammed onto public transport. Uh, and archaeologists saying basically we're being asked to go into work on these sites and we're being asked to go in on the tube and bus systems which are overcrowded. It's being central London, many sites don't have parking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or for example, people unit, can't drive in individually. Or for example, unit transportation, so vans. You know, uh, even if there's a fleet of yeah, vans, uh, often, yeah. it's a van it's, per it, job. It, yeah, absolutely a van per job, and you put you know half a dozen people on a minibus, there isn't much room. No. No, exactly. um, you can't keep two meters apart within a transit minibus. Mm. So you know it, it, it's it's questionable whether archaeologists can achieve that and continue to work in any meaningful way. Mm. Then it follows that um, the, the, there have been mixed messages from the government. Um, initially, everybody was meant to maintain this kind of social distancing. Um, then they started to, to define essential workers um, who could break those rules because the, the, the work was decided as uh, to be more essential. And for some reason, um, the construction industry working on sites other than immediate sites to support the NHS, like hospital extensions and things like that, which you can understand that there's a justification for continuing with those. Mm -hmm. But you, you, when you get to continuing to build you know, private developments, private speculative developments, mm -hmm. and the archaeology that's associated with those, you wonder, is that actually essential? 
Well, and, and I suppose actually, in that sense, you've touched on one of the key concerns, and that is the the, the prospect that uh, either building projects cannot go ahead without the legally uh, required archaeological investigation, Absolutely. or archaeologists fear that building building projects will go ahead despite archaeological investigation, and therefore uh, archaeologists are feeling ethically bound in some cases to try and stay on site for as long as possible. And 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 there's a there's a there's a third factor, which is actually um, one again, which the um, sector has to address mm. which is there have been fears on the part of some archaeologists that if their company withdraws from a contract on safety grounds another company will come in and say we can do that yeah yeah um and uh it remains to be seen whether the archaeological bodies like federation of Archeo archaeological managers and employers fame mm -hmm. um and the um algoa the Association of Local Government Archaeologists can actually get a grip on that kind of thing. Mm. Um, the... Well, and, and 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 to that end, uh, we have linked to uh, a range of uh, of different. Uh, holding pages in terms of statements on COVID-19. Um, yeah. CIFA has put out a statement. Uh, we have linked to, uh, as you say, the uh, Association of Local Government Archaeological Officers. Um, yeah. FAME has a page, but it's 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 lacking in some respect. You, you, say, you were saying you've been trying to get a response from mm -hmm. FAME for a few days, have you? Um, for the last, well, since this uh, the lockdown started uh, last Tuesday. Um, I've been trying to get comments from fame, particularly at the end of last week when uh, there was a lot of traffic on archaeological social media saying basically, basically people were uncomfortable with having to go into work. Mm -hmm. um, and here, a, a shout out for the archaeological section of the Trade Union Prospect who've done brilliant work mm -hmm. in highlighting this and also providing their members and the rest of the profession with open advice mm -hmm. uh, on health and safety in, in the current situation. They've, done, they've played a blinder on this. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, but fame on the other hand, uh, they've been re they've reduced uh, they produce some sort of bland statements for their <clears> members, <throat> but um, there has been no accountability really in terms of speaking to the wider media and public. We've been, uh, I say I've asked on a number of occasions uh, some specific questions, and absolutely blanked. I have to say the government um, relevant government department, uh, the Department for Business. Um, which oversees the construction side, um, I asked similar questions to, and they've also blanked it. So, um, you know, it, it, fame aren't alone in this. But I think it's, uh, uh, this, whole, this whole situation is raising some very uncomfortable questions, and I think people are going to have to face up to them at some point. Yeah. It's a question of when. And, and, and the thing is, is that so we should be clear, we're not, we're not, um, we're not... <laughs> so the the dog clearly agreeing with you there. Uh, yes. we're, we're not uh, we're not criticising people or organisations in a very difficult time. Obviously, everyone's scrambling to to get yes. on top of this. Frankly, lots of the people who will be putting out these and writing these these statements and these these holding positions will be working from home and trying to 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 get their head around that. Um, but also as well, the 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 sort of the 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 piecemeal ongoing rolling response is also highlighted in a statement uh, on the CIFA website written by uh, an associated administrator um, headlined archaeologists PPE personal protective equipment could save lives of health workers and their patients and it's actually suggesting uh, well he says here please click this link if you feel that you or your business can offer support during these difficult times so in that sense we I guess we acknowledge that it's, it's not the easiest thing to to be on top of this right now but at the same time there are an awful lot of archaeologists who, who who as i say had that that ethical pull or that 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 frankly that wallet pull to work or maybe in some cases uh you know we've heard for example in the building industry about bosses being very unscrupulous in terms of insisting that their workers work in certain circumstances that they shouldn't be um and having having clear advice from these organizations would be helpful at this time and and hopefully that's going to be coming very soon I, I, I think so. I think it has to. Um, I think there has been a probably unconscious attempt, or at least certainly the whole bias in commercial archaeology is not to rock the boat. Mm. It's to work within the system. It's not to antagonize developers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to provide a, a service at a... Uh, at a competitive price point 
um, and not put too many conditions on that service if it's if, if it's possible for fear that they might lose the business. Yeah. And faced with a situation like this, when it's actually quite stark, it's if you carry on working, you might dam- you might be damaging the health of your people. Mm-hmm. Um, the system's finding it difficult to adjust. Well, partic- and particularly uh, in the context of what we were talking about with uh, Mike Hayworth uh, last week, mm-hmm. um, the interview obviously is on on our um, mm-hmm. in terms of the, this, uh, what could be described as a race to the bottom in the commercial mm-hmm. sector. People, as you as you've already uh, referred to, this idea of people and uh, coming in and providing a job for less, and the fear of losing out on work uh, because someone else is willing to cut corners. Um, Again, standard statements and 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 protocols are are definitely necessary. Uh, in, in a in a broader sense, though, away from um, from from digging and 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 that that coal face, um, we've had other things uh, going on. So I suppose starting with the with the more um, what's the word the more uh, uh, relatable. Um, first of all. Uh, uh, you you pointed me uh, actually even this morning to a link from uh, Her- the Heritage Fund, Heritage Lottery Fund, uh, or mm. Lottery Heritage Fund, as it's now called. National it's, Lottery Heritage Fund. That's it. Yeah, they've called. changed their name. Um, how the coronavirus COVID nineteen is affecting the heritage sector, and they're pointing to uh, a, a survey that they've conducted in which ninety one percent of respondents have confirmed that they've had to cancel events. Sixty nine percent are affected by a loss of revenue. Eighty-two um, percent of organisations across the country and uh, have reported a high or moderate risk of their long-term viability, and uh, and you were saying that many don't uh, consider it to be a high possibility that that they may not be able to exist beyond the summer, beyond June. Uh, well, this is what, this is one of the conclusions from the the research that the National Heritage Lottery Fund, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, have highlighted in the the blog that accompanies the um, their their, um, their their research or um, introduces their research, um, and I and should say um, this is a moving story. The um, the organisation is due today actually to announce a support package based on this research, mm. but it's absolutely. St- it, it's it's stark, and again, this this also applies to some of the smaller archaeological units, probably, and actually even, even some of the bigger ones, mm-hmm. um, who if they that uh, the finances of archaeology and small museums and so on are such that very often there are no cash reserves. No. Um, well, yeah. The current the current the current job, you know, the the, the, the current job is funded by the previous one. Mm-hmm. Um, or, 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 you know, or, or frankly, often the current job is funded by by funding that's been promised. You know, it, it can be on, even... on the on the yeah, mm. ab- absolutely, yes, exactly. Um, so you end up with a situation uh, which, as the, as they say, around a third of the charity or third sector organisations and around a third of community and voluntary groups said they could not exist beyond yeah. July. That you know, and if you think about that in what three months time mm-hmm. we could lose a third of the heritage sector yeah That's how stark it is yeah and well, all the jobs that that entails all the expertise that that entails the collections that those organizations mm-hmm. look after and mm-hmm. curate you know it it, it, it uh, yeah, and again we're, we're talking about the heritage sector in particular this applies across the board um, no, of you know, it, it, it is yeah. an unprecedented situation, yeah. and we 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 we're, we're not special. We are, you know, we're part of communities, and you know, communities have to uh, a, a, a having to scra- uh, scramble really to find solutions to this. You, you know, you, you, you we've just seen the a, a UK Chancellor of the Exchequer from the Conservative Party from the from the broadly the the right of centre part of the of the Conservative Party. Um, the, the fiscally conservative part of the Conservative Party spending money in the way that a Labour Chancellor would never have been able to. Well, yeah, um, well, a Labour Chancellor probably would, would, not, not only wouldn't have been able to, but it also would have been lambasted for doing so. Yeah, precisely, yeah, yeah, precisely. Yeah, certainly in the press. You yeah. know, uh, yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. You, you know, you, you're seeing the same tensions in the, in, in the United States at the moment uh, with the American government committing trillions of dollars to mm-hmm. trying to support the economy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, through through this, so that there's some sort of soft landing on the other side. Uh, the art sector are doing exactly the same thing. Uh, we, we've got, uh, you know, we, we've got support coming in for people 
in the freelance market, which again applies to a lot of archaeological finds specialists work freelance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, if the work's not happening, they won't be having jobs coming in. Well, and, um, and that's also, even supposing that they work from home. Well, no, yeah, well, indeed. And then also the, the same applies to you and I. You know, we've both seen our our work calendars more or less empty. <laughs> um, yes. uh, but also I, it should be noted that, again, it's, it is a country by country response. And I have to say I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. I never thought I'd say this, but I'm grateful for this particular conservative <laughs> government uh, and its response so far in so much as we know that come the end of June-ish, as in my case, for example, as a sole trader, I presume you you're, you're, you have a similar status. In the same situation, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, there will be support coming, and and to know yeah. that that's the case is wonderful. I, I mean, you mentioned that the US is protecting its economy at the moment, but it's not necessarily protecting people in a similar situation to what we are in. Well, um, yeah, absolutely. There's that staggering statistic. There was that staggering statistic that came out a few days ago, that something like three million people within the space of forty eight hours had applied for unemployment benefits in the states. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's, yeah, it's quite staggering. Yeah, and especially considering the um the uh, I think there's a bit more of a taboo around doing that than there is here in the UK. Mm. I think I think it's a bit more. Um, you have to be you have to be desperate to do it in the US, definitely. Not that you don't have to. You know, do you know what I mean? Anyway, it's it's a big it's as country by country. It's interesting to see what's happening. C getting back on topic though. Um, so we talked about mm. uh, the um, also in topic in so much as the watching briefs historical and archaeological focus. Uh, we've talked a little bit about, uh, for sure. example, uh, places like well. Well, uh, the, the, the individual museums, et cetera, um, having problems and, and being at risk. But one that we've got to mention, sorry, is um, is the, uh, for example, Cresswell Crags came to my attention very early. In Nottinghamshire, yeah. Yeah, uh, that they, they put yeah. out a call saying, we, we might not make it through this, guys. And what's what what the unfortunate uh, perhaps thing... Should, perhaps we should explain for, for people mm -hmm. that aren't mm -hmm. uh, prehistorians or haven't, haven't visited Cresswell, it's... A, an absolutely wonderful site and it's probably one of the most important stone age sites in, in certainly in the uk if not in europe in terms of the uh, it, it, i think it's one of the uh, uh, for example the first identified rock art in in england if i remember correctly uh yeah i think so there's also more recently more recently there's been stories about uh 17th century witch marks being found on indeed the site. Um, and actually, I, I conducted an interview with uh, with a member of staff there earlier this year. No, last was it this year? Last year, last year um, <laughs> um, about the about those witch marks. We're all losing we're mm. losing track of time, Andy, already. Um, uh, uh, and so, in that sense, sorry. So they put out a call early on, and because of that, they have they announced. You were saying uh, was it yesterday that they, that they've raised so far ten thousand. That's right. That's that's right. That they, they um, very early on, um, as the government was saying, basically outdoor gatherings are banned and people should not leave their homes. Mm -hmm. That immediately took away the entire market for museums and visitor attractions. Mm. And the Creswell Crags were very quick off the mark. It's a private charity, educational mm -hmm. charity that runs it, or at least runs the visitor centre there, I should say, and, 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 and the education programmes. Well, and in, and in that sense, um, in that sense, I guess also it's broadly oversees that portion of the valley as well. I suppose. In, in, indeed, yeah, indeed, yeah. indeed. It's 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 a it's an amazing valley on the edge of the Peak District, um, and it's on the Nottinghamshire Nottinghamshire Derbyshire border, if I remember correctly. Um, I think it's just into Nottinghamshire, um, which is the local authority, which again was, uh, does not fund them for the um, you know they don't receive local authority support. Mm -hmm. um, and they very quick. They were the the, the Creswell Crags Charity were very quickly out the blocks with a with a, a crowd funder, and uh, in a week they just over a week they've raised. They announced yesterday evening ten thousand mm. pounds. Now that's it's a lifeboat, mm -hmm. really. That's all it is, mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, and it's a terrific effort on behalf, on their part on the part of the the people who've supported them. I I think though it's worth saying that not every charity in a similar situation will be able to to do that um well they'll be able to do it the but they can't rely on an ever ever decreasing pool of people who this, aren't this, themselves necessarily in receipt of of income this um, this is this is the point and and and, and obviously some of the, the larger independent charities will have even, will have much larger overheads in terms of they'll have made large buildings to support they might maybe having sites that uh 
require ongoing conservation to stop them deteriorating, mm -hmm. uh, or will do in the in, in the next few months. You know, it, there are so many imponderables, and, and that's why it's important that National Heritage Lottery Fund, uh, or National Lottery Heritage Fund, or whatever we're calling it in the at the moment, um, you know, produces a package in conjunction with the government's support for the wages of individuals who've been furloughed, um, or freelancers like you and I. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so again, these organisations, these sites, these attractions, these important parts of our culture mm. um, are still there when people can start to go out again. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. And, and, I'm particular, and in that sense, I guess I'm, I'm going to try and find some, a smaller uh, site or charity to try and support through this if I if I can if I have any spare money uh, at all um, I just quickly just looked at the National Trust's uh, statement at the moment and they're not they're not mentioning that they're in trouble they're talking much more about about their staff's welfare which is good because actually um, yes. uh, last the last I knew the National Trust had a healthy um, a healthy uh, rainy day fund shall we say I think, I think indeed I, I, and they have they have income from legacies and things like that, which other charities don't have, particularly the newer ones. You know, newer, smaller charities haven't had a chance to build up any reserves, haven't had a chance to build up. You know, lottery funded project, projects that maybe are only 10, 15, at most 20 odd years, 25 years old, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. haven't got the same reach, haven't had the same opportunities to to build up brand identity, build up legacies, build up cash reserves mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. some of the larger um you know, organisations have done. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's, it's particularly the smaller ones I think we're concerned about. And obviously the smaller ones often have some of them, you know, more unique and more interesting and more, perhaps more niche, but, you know, just as important uh, collections and, and, and sites to look after. It would be a shame if they're lost. Um, other, uh, another aspect to think about here as well is uh, UK universities, which are obviously uh, integral to, uh, to, to, to archaeology often in terms of training. Um, mm. They're facing a cash black hole in t amid the coronavirus. <laughs> Frankly, they're already facing difficult times when it came to uh, uh, staff going on strike linked with uh, procurement and, and, and the, uh, um, the management of their pension schemes. Uh, and just general pay and, and workers' rights. The fact, sorry, many yes. of the, the fact, yes, the fact that many of them are on, uh, uh, aren't on uh, fixed-term con uh, fixed contracts or even um, they're, they're on gig economy contracts with uh, no guarantee of work from yeah, month to and month. They're, and they're being asked to do lots of work that is not actually part of their job for free and all this kind of thing in terms of administration. Yes. So universities are already facing a bit of a crisis there. Um, this year, though, strikes plus uh, uh, you know, lockdown orders. Um, the question at the moment is, will the, uh, students be able to graduate? Um, some people are suggesting that, the, that there could be uh, a system based on previously attained marks throughout the course. Other people are actually, other, some students are pushing for money back actually from, from universities. So, so that's an aspect of this, of this impact. Yeah, and again, we have we have to remind our our audience that uh, certainly now universities like to see themselves as educational businesses by and large. Yeah, um, that we, with with uh, branches abroad and um, offering you know a yeah the moment um, students started paying fees then. Um, paying fees themselves rather than having grants which was the case uh, and certainly I was lucky enough I was one of the last um, generation to, to have university grants mm -hmm. uh, so I've never uh, uh, but looking at our own family um, you have uh, we have one, one member of our immediate family has uh, not been that due to the strikes and then the lockdowns hasn't had any face-to-face -face tuition or hardly any face-to-face -face tuition the entire this entire term mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. just coming to an end mm -hmm. um, now she's doing a law conversion and has been told by her university that um, there will still be exams but they can't tell them what form those exams will take no exactly yeah and yeah. it remains to be seen whether the relevant legal organizations will rec then recognize those exams as adequate to it's kosher, yeah. As, uh, yeah. So but, no, but, but, there, there are all these all, all these issues are in, are, are in play. Um, well, on, a... on the 
Go on, but there's, there's also the fact that lots of archaeological uh, uh, um, lecturers, readers, staff mm. are having to adjust to uh, to purely online teaching. Um, I've been offering some uh, tuition to a couple of different people lately in terms of the use of uh, some of the technologies that, that I use to, to, to put together packages that they can plug into then online teaching forums. But ultimately, this, I think this is this, 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 uh, another impact of this, this COVID crisis is that it's, it's showing, um, that actually online learning solutions, especially ones that are one size fits all. So a solution that a university just buys in, that's meant to be able mm -hmm. to, to help you teach art history, chemistry, you know, <laughs> earth yeah. sciences, archaeology, um, it does isn't necessarily the easiest to use or the or the or the most appropriate platform in terms of it, its help its usefulness for learning and in fact for having a a naturalistic sense of teaching often lecturers have a certain delivery style or a personality that comes through and that aids the understanding of what they're saying that that at the moment is being lost in some of these mechanisms and, and so I, I worry about I, that so go on I, 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 absolutely and you know, there's been a lot of talk in the last few weeks um, about for example will universities ever go back to as much face-to-face um, -face lecture theatre style teaching mm -hmm. as they did pre-COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see an advantage in a university, for example, saying, okay, uh, a programme of lectures, we can record a programme of lectures, we'll pay you for a programme of lectures, and then we'll record that, and then we'll play that out to, uh, our, uh, make that available to our students on the university website, password protected, and... Um, we, we we can if we repeat the course we can give you a repeat fee mm. Mm. rather than pay you a salary yeah no exactly yeah and but also that but then <sighs> even if you do that what do you do with the stuff that has to be done face to face hand to hand the laboratory work you can't teach a conservator um, without them actually handling material no you can't yeah. you can't and, and I. Uh, I think if if handled properly, it, it, this could this could actually mean that like, that that uh, academic staff get more time for research, more time to support students, uh, and more time to do do other tasks that they that they currently um, wish they had time to do. That said, though, there are legitimate concerns about uh, about the the status of those lectures in terms of ownership. Presum at the moment, yes. universities would like to own those lectures those recordings Indeed. whereas arguably Indeed. as with uh, an essay a book or you know or, or a paper um it's there's an intellectual property issue and uh, well lots of lots of academics are i think i think rightly I, I used to be a little less understanding but i think increasingly i'm much more um on the side of people who are concerned about their performance as it were being owned by someone else and then them getting some me relatively meager royalties for that and also well, the, I, the fact so and also so the fact that it can't be modified to reflect the latest research you know the next year i think again these simple solutions aren't straightforward so go ahead so no well, all i was gonna say was i mean you, you know that uh, um we, we've discussed it a number of times before uh, um I, my, my opinion certainly is that uh, for example uh, academic publishing is a racket Mm. and that people are expected to produce work for publication where everybody else is paid except them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, not only that, it's put behind a paywall which, uh, which makes it unavailable to anybody else to read outside of a magic circle. Mm. Um, of, of people who actually subscribe to the journals in question. So, who's, who's you know, money, Whose money does not go to the authors? Or, or even necessarily to the universities. It no. just goes to mm. very large multinational publishing houses mm, yeah. um so you know uh it it's those sorts of issues were already in play before this mm. um there hasn't been time interestingly f for a lot of the universities you know, to, to a lot of a lot of people are doing things that are uh, open access they're, they're 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 sharing knowledge sharing links doing online uh, mini courses and so on, which have been generated that, uh, and that they're generating, you know, in real time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as as a service to the to the to their students, but also to the wider community. And uh, it it's sort of it's changing the mindset. I think with all of this, it remains to be seen 
how long term the effects will be. We yeah. can't predict that at the moment. Uh, all we can be, do, all we can do, is be aware of the issue so that going forward we know what needs to be discussed. And and, and but the, I think the, the the biggest worry for me, and just moving the conversation on maybe a little bit, um, we saw we, um, in I think it was the previous watching brief we talked about. Um, various humanities courses being axed because they weren't seen as being economically valuable to mm -hmm. both the university and to the students mm -hmm. in a particular region of the country in the northeast. Mm -hmm. um, I think particularly as archaeology departments and some humanities departments, some history departments so on, are relatively small in terms of the university economy and also don't generate the immediate research, big research grants that say, for example, some of the science departments can doing R&D in conjunction with industry and so on. Mm -hmm. um, push comes to shove, if vice chancellors are making economic decisions about what courses are viable and what aren't, I think certainly in some of the smaller and regional universities, maybe London's a slightly different position because people will always want to come to London. Um, but certainly, uh, humanities courses are probably at more risk than most. Yes, no, I agree. I agree. I agree. So I slightly raised my eyebrow there at the prospect that people always want to come to London. Uh, that I don't want to go to London, but um... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. G given that walking down a street in London like, uh, is a bit like the day after the zombie apocalypse at the moment, yeah, I can understand that. Entirely. Well, I mean, not just at the moment, just in general, I, I'm quite ha quite happy in the in the wild of the northeast. But no, I see what you mean. Yes, London London has a certain uh, economic shell and bubble, and also, frankly, a density of of uh, of interest driven largely by a middle class in archaeology and heritage and history and this kind of thing that that that, that, that makes it more sustainable there that then for example i don't know uh you know a, a, a polytechnic university or something like that Kind of yeah, but, I mean, bringing our conversation back full circle, it's why archaeologists are working on development sites where people are building high-end flats that are bought by investors from Russia and the Far East and yeah. uh, and so on as, as investment. And, and that, you know, they send their children here for an education. And Indeed. why shouldn't they? Indeed. One of the things that is really important about this mm -hmm. is archaeologists ask themselves, what is the place of what we do in our wider communities. There, there, um, there were, when, when the row blew up about archaeologists being made to work on apparently uh, non-essential construction, mm -hmm. some people were saying the archaeology has to carry on or otherwise it will be lost. Other people were saying actually you can't, in these circumstances, in these amazing circumstances, you can't equate archaeology with a frontline medic or whatever. Next. Now, and, 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 and the other question is about, you, you raised the issue, and I didn't pick it up at the time, and I, and I just wanted to raise it now just very quickly. Um, archaeologists are, are donating PPE equipment mm -hmm. to um, hospitals. Now, it's a whole other story, and we won't go into it here, but basically, and, and, and it's still rumbling on this morning, the government appears to have royally screwed up procurement of personal protective equipment of mm -hmm. an adequate standard for the hundreds of thousands of frontline workers in the National Health Service. Mm. At a time when it's needed most, the thing isn't there, the stuff isn't there. Mm -hmm. Now, if archaeologists are carrying on working and are on sites where they're doing, for example, forensic recoveries of human remains, where you normally do it suited and masked and so on, mm -hmm. or is that... Asbestos, for example. Uh, or in a, or an asbestos contaminated site where you're using a an industri industrial standard uh, respirator and so on, mm -hmm. is it appropriate that you as an archaeologist are using that material that 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 equipment when it is when somebody could be using it to save somebody's life? Indeed, and the thing is, in the, in the past, you know. Uh, uh, we've established many times now, I think, in watching brief, that 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 that. that the National Health Service, law and order, uh, other forms of well-being come ahead of archaeology in the, 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 the hierarchy of need. But ultimately, our focus is archaeology and history in, the, yeah. in this watching brief, and that's the yeah. reason why we're commenting on it. Now, the thing is, I suppose what I would say is that, the, that said, though, it's all well and good saying, you know, is, is archaeology really more important than a human life? The answer mm -hmm. is, of course, it's not. 
Uh, but but in terms of the legal framework of of how things happen in this country, the the, the uh, at the moment archaeology has a place in the in the the mechanisms of, for example, development that are ongoing. That yeah. means that that there is a legitimate pressure on people to do archaeology still, and also yes. to to have that be part of the legal the legal legally required documentation and response to a development for example or a building so yeah. it's one of those things where uh i and I'm, i don't i know you're not but i, I would just want to just, just clarify i would not ever say to an archaeologist or archaeologists who feel ethically or legally obliged to do some form of archaeology on site and protect themselves that they should feel as though they're effectively taking you know, taking protection away from the NHS. The fact of the matter is, the NHS should be should have its own stocks anyway. Absolutely. Not, and also, I'm not also not saying that archaeologists shouldn't consider donating to the NHS. Yeah. But as you say, this this is this is the story of a governmental level blunder, and so it's yes. not it's not an archae it's not archaeologists' fault. So so if if no. you are someone who's watching this, don't feel bad if you if you if you have been using this equipment you know you're you're not you're not procurement for nhs you know, you know in that sense no uh, um, I, I, no, no I, I think all, all, all i'm saying is again individual archaeologists shouldn't be put in that position of feeling bad no. about that we should be get you know the sector should be having more assertive more responsive and more actually responsible leadership yes. from the leadership organizations and at the moment it, there's been a lot of committees meeting and and so on and there's been a lot of fudged positions yeah yeah, decisive decisive leadership yeah 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 um well can i can i i'll just round up in the way that i, I, I was going to round up um <laughs> Go on. it's a, I, it's I, a, I just wanted just to say that you know we've allowed this topic to breathe i think quite rightly um and uh a couple of other links that i've included is one of them is a blog post that i wrote a couple of days ago just reflecting on on an aspect of this which is social distancing uh, it's it's a fairly it's a fairly light philosophical archaeological jaunt through a supermarket as it were but uh, it's it's something that it's a, it's a side it's a side note to the effect of, of this this pandemic is is we're living in experiences let's say living in circumstances and experiencing things that we ordinarily wouldn't so yeah this is this is that's that's something archaeologists i'm sure will be noticing all sorts of interesting cultural things going on at the moment um and finally a little bit of a smile at the store at the story um of a man fearing the end of the world has returned an ancient stolen relic um in uh, in jerusalem i believe uh, they took a a a, a, a a stone that was from a ballista, I think, uh, a, 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 basically a bit of ammo, um, and they they decided to return it, fearing the end of the world, and presumably someone in the afterlife saying, "Why have you got that rock in your garden?" Uh, so this that's is presumably a... one of the rocks that was chucked at Jerusalem by the emperor, uh, well, uh, by Titus and the uh, um, and the besieging Romans. But, well, it says here um... yeah, the stones were most likely used by the Roman legion in fierce battles against the besieged residents of Jerusalem around seventy. Uh, uh, yeah. CE, um, the yeah. year of the destruction of Jerusalem. So um, yeah, so a, a, a little, a little, a little smile at the end, a little tongue-in-cheek smile. So we've literally just decided, after recording this month's watching brief, to actually turn this section into its own little piece. So uh, a, a good healthy chunk of watching brief, uh, essentially as a as a special bulletin style, um, as we have done in the past, dedicated to 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 the coronavirus and its impact on uh on our sector uh hopefully that that makes sense for you guys watching in so much as we we didn't want to essentially have a massive three hour thing and actually i guess that means that that on the various platforms where we release this you're going to get a bumper special episode so so that's what we've done hopefully that's With been extras. worthwhile exactly a bit, little bit of extras and uh and i guess the message is stay safe wash your hands and and look after each other and also i guess just be be good be excellent to one another as bill and ted would say yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. so uh be excellent yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh yes yes sage sage advice um so as ever until next time do take care bye bye take very take very good care bye bye